I'm so proud that we have someone as special as we have here today. Our keynote will be given by Ambassador Wendy Sherman. She's currently senior counselor at Albright Stonebridge Group, and she is a senior fellow at Harvard University's Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs. She began her career as a social worker seeking to expand housing opportunities for our poorest citizens. And she joined the State Department during President Clinton's administration as an administrative secretary for legislative affairs. Later, she served as counselor for the Department of State and uh, uh, focused on North Korea policy and became the North Korea coordinator, instrumental in negotiating, uh, hopefully, outcomes with North Korea on nuclear weapons and ballistic missile programs. Not an easy assignment. And during President Obama's administration, she served as undersecretary for political affairs. That's the fourth highest ranking at the Department of State. And she was our lead negotiator uh, for the Iran nuclear agreement between Iran and the so-called P5, which involves five permanent members of the United Nations, that is China, France, Russia, uh, the United Kingdom, and the United States. And the fifth is, or the uh, plus one, is uh, Germany and the European Union. And for this, and her many, many diplomatic contributions, the President Obama awarded her the National Security Medal. Ambassador Sherman has served on the President's Intelligence Advisory Board, the Department of Defense's Policy Board, and the Congressional Commission on the, uh, the, uh, to prevent weapons of mass destruction, proliferation, and terrorism. We are so honored that she, she made the time to be with us today and to keynote this 2017 uh, Foreign Policy Colloquium. I know we're all going to learn from her remarks. Wendy, the podium is yours. Oh, goodness. Usually when you get introductions like that, you should stop. <laughs> uh, first of all, thank you to Ambassador Hills. Not just for the warm introduction, but for your incredible years of service. When I finished at the Clinton administration, I did consulting for a year. And then uh, Secretary Albright, myself, two other women, and a very brave guy <laughs> decided we wanted to start a global consulting firm because, quite frankly, other than Ambassador Hills, there were no other consulting firms that were led principally by women. And so Carla Hills was our role model for starting the firm. There's plenty of business to go around. Uh, so we compete in a really special and wonderful way. And no one can match her trade negotiation abilities. Um, so. I just want to honor her and everything that she has done for our country, including chairing for so long uh, the US-China uh, Committee, uh, because it's critical. I've been privileged to be part of this program once before, as uh, Jan and Steve recall. And it's always fun, because you all have great questions. So I'm going to speak for about 15 or 20 minutes, but I'm really looking forward to the dialogue that we'll have with each other. It's always a real pleasure to come to the Elliott School. Uh, I agree you should take it back as an institution worthy of uh, all of our interest. More than ever, uh, we want to nurture open hearts and open minds in young people and strengthen everybody's commitment to a global future. You all are here on a day where, quite frankly, my heart is breaking. Uh, because President Trump decided to withdraw from the Paris Agreement. And you all understand living in China and having overcome and thought about development, how critical it is that we have clean air and clean water and that we save the Earth. So 
I'm hopeful we can talk about that some in our dialogue, and I am hopeful that our country and states in our country, like California, New York, Florida, others, Texas even, will find their way forward, even with this decision by the President. So I want to thank George Washington University for hosting this evening. Also, I'm very grateful to Minister Counselor Joe for joining us. Um, he is really a superb diplomat. I've had the occasion to work with him when I was Under Secretary for Political Affairs, and you were very fortunate to have his representation. And I consider Ambassador Shui, for whom I hope you will send my deepest regards, uh, a dear friend. Uh, having a conversation with Ambassador Shu is uh, Ambassador Shui is having a uh, history lesson. Uh, he understands so much of what has happened in the world. I always learn an enormous amount every time I sit down with him. And as everyone knows, uh, maintaining strong U.S.-China relations certainly requires sound and steady leadership, and we're very glad to have the ambassador here in Washington. I also want to thank Yancey, Steve, Jan, the staff, uh, everyone on the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations for inviting me to share this evening with you. And I want to congratulate the National Committee for all the work over the last half century in bringing people together to learn more about the most important, the most important bilateral relationship for our generation, really your generation, my generation sort of over the hill. No pun intended. Name any major challenge of our time, resolving threats posed by nuclear and missile programs, curbing climate change, or promoting more balanced and sustainable glo global economic growth, none, none can be achieved without strong cooperation between the United States and China. The United States has interests in every corner of the world, and China increasingly so. Other countries will naturally look to us for leadership in tackling challenges that will impact all of us. I'm looking forward to our conversation, as I said, to hear from you all and share our views on the future of this important relationship and what it means for the world. But first, I want to take a step back and begin our colloquium tonight by offering some general thoughts on current challenges to global engagement. Namely, how do we confront the multitude of issues effectively at a time when there is significant backlash against globalization in many countries, including here in the United States? How will rising populism in the United States and around the world impact US-China relations, as well as American and Chinese leaders' efforts to manage issues of international concern? And what can our two countries do together to restore faith and credibility in the current global system? a system that has enabled nations to thrive and prosper, including and especially China, over the last two generations. For those of us in the American foreign policy community, addressing widespread skepticism toward globalization and foreign engagement is, in many ways, the key challenge we now face. We are a democracy, after all. And we will not be able to sustain our economic and security commitment to the world unless we can bring our citizens on board. The burden is on us and our leaders to be persuasive. Of course, as I noted a moment ago, rising nationalism and isolationism are not uniquely American challenges. Leaders throughout Europe and indeed around the world are also being tested by an upsurge in populist sentiments. In fact, when the Pew Global Attitudes Project did its first survey in 2002 of 44 countries, people in emerging markets liked what they got from globalization. Better food choices, better pharmaceutical choices. My favorite statistic was from Vietnam, where 90% of the population loved cell phones when only 10% of them had them. So people liked what they were getting from globalization, but even then, People were afraid of losing their identity, their cultural heritage, their way of life. And that fear 
has come home to the developed world as well. We certainly saw this during the campaign leading up to Brexit. We saw this in France and in the Netherlands, though the eventual election outcomes may have represented at least somewhat of a recognition of the downside of these appeals. We also arguably have seen this in Asia as well, for example, in the Philippines and South Korea to some degree. And we see this in the ongoing debate about what makes one German, or to quote another recent Pew study, whether someone must speak the national language to be considered one of us in the United States, Canada, Europe, Australia, or Japan. For us in the United States, the 2016 election provided a warning bell of sorts, laying bare the anxiety and fear that many of our citizens feel as they increasingly find themselves lost in a very rapidly and accelerating changing world. Globalization, technology, and trade have challenged the American middle class existence, even ironically as they have enabled dramatic increases in wealth and strengthened middle classes elsewhere. Economic changes and cross-border movements of people have been momentous and far-ranging. The combination of all of this has left many people feeling unanchored. The anxiety Americans feel is real and consequential, as is the anxiety of people all over the world facing income inequality, as well as the uneven impact of trade and technology, including the looming impact of the greater development and diffusion of artificial intelligence. It's certainly exciting that technology will soon bring us self-driving cars. <clears throat> but have policymakers thought deeply and thoroughly about what this innovation means to the livelihood of 4.5 million drivers in this country? It is the top profession in 37 American states. When people feel they are losing control of their own futures, then they are more afraid and suspicious of people who are not like them, who do not look like them, or speak the same language as them. And so they hang on to the local, to kinship and ties that they know, and reject the central, whether it is Washington, or London, or Brussels, and even perhaps Beijing. And they question the credibility of global elites who, seen as out of touch, seem to be more interested in abstract issues than the concerns of local communities. They view someone educated at Harvard as having more in common with his or her peers at Oxford or Xinhua or tech-centric Silicon Valley than fellow citizens in Stockton, Manchester, or Wuhan. In other words, a generation of rapid global economic integration and technological revolution have created very different experiences for those who thrived in this new economy as compared with those who saw their living standards decline, in part due to the unequal distribution of benefits of globalization. This has, in turn, seriously undermined the political consensus in favor of openness, as well as spurred many people to recoil from this vision of an increasingly global future. One, quite frankly, we cannot turn back. How, then? Do we lessen the material divide between those parallel experiences and ensure that those who are more grounded can do just as well as those who rotate through airport lounges? How do we restore the credibility of this global project that has lifted hundreds and millions out of poverty and offered choices to consumers everywhere in ways the world has never seen? In Washington, American policymakers must find creative ways to enable our citizens to see that they, too, have a stake in this global future. We must start with the recognition that foreign policymaking cannot be isolated from the lived experiences of the country. <clears throat> foreign policy must be developed in tandem with thoughtful domestic policies aimed at preparing our people to compete and thrive in a global economy. American leaders must develop and implement a credible and effective domestic policy program that addresses these key sources of economic anxiety in an era of globalization. We can do this by strengthening our social safety net, 
providing greater support for workers to transition to new industries, upgrading our human capital through support for targeted training in community colleges, and boosting investments in our critical infrastructure. Business leaders must join political leaders to explain to the American public how the United States benefits from global trade and an open investment environment, and why we should not, must not, quite frankly cannot, retreat from globalization. China has an increasingly critical role to play in this global project. It is in China's interest now to assume a greater role as a responsible international stakeholder and leader, as President Xi himself acknowledged during his extraordinary speech at Davos earlier this year. As a rising power, China needs to be part of the solution and to help sustain support for globalization, not just at home, but around the world, by adhering to open international trade and investment regimes in good faith. Part of the challenge of globalization, as I noted earlier, are the rising perceptions that the system may not be fair and may not benefit all countries and groups equally. And this undoubtedly has been fueled by questions about China's large and growing impact on the global trading system across so many different industries. Given that China is now the largest trading nation and largest exporter, questions about whether China is fully adhering to WTO rules and operating according to genuine market principles matter vastly more to the legitimacy of the international trading system than was the case just a decade ago. Chinese leaders have talked about the need to continue the process of economic reform and opening to facilitate the next stage of China's development. But beyond these domestic motivations for continued liberalization, China also should be motivated by the rising course of critics who question whether the system is delivering on its promises that rising trade and investment flows would deliver mutual benefits to all countries. We are well past the point a few years ago when the failure of the Doha round merely resulted in concerns focused on the loss of momentum for multilateral <laughs> trade liberalization. Things are much more dangerous now, as many countries, including the United States, are considering protectionist policies that could roll back the painstaking process we have achieved over many decades. It is in this context that China must consider the international impact of its domestic policy choices. Take, for instance, the global concerns over China's industrial overcapacity and cybersecurity policies and practices as examples that people often cite. Of course, China is not the only country that has experienced overcapacity in steel and aluminum. But China's size has meant that its overcapacity has dramatically changed the supply and demand dynamics of the global markets in these sectors. For this reason, China has a heavy burden of demonstrating that it is taking action both unilaterally and as part of a cooperative international process to address these problems. I fear that failure to do so will drive protectionism around the world in a way that it would not have just 10 or 15 years ago. And campaign rhetoric in democracies around the world have made this painfully, abundantly clear. Similarly, China's ongoing efforts to develop and implement cybersecurity rules that could potentially exclude many foreign IT suppliers from operating in China can also distort global markets and dent the competitiveness of non-Chinese multinationals. While maintaining cybersecurity is a legitimate national goal for any nation, China, in my view, has proposed a set of policies that have raised serious concerns about whether foreign companies will be forced to disclose core intellectual property or even not be able to meet Chinese security, secure and controllable requirements. As the largest site for manufacturing of IT products, if China is seen as closing the market for many of these products, it will have a profound impact. China has a major interest in working with the United States and other countries to find ways to develop cybersecurity rules that maintain legitimate security interests while not closing the market and creating imbalances in global commerce. It is a responsibility the United States has as well. Both the United States and China, 
as the largest and most consequential economies in the world share the burden and responsibility to ensure that our global system can continue in a way that is appropriate and beneficial for not just Americans and Chinese, but people around the world. The extent to which the two countries are successful in managing and rebalancing global governance will, in part, determine the ability of governments around the world to secure broad popular support in engaging and confronting the key challenges facing the world. This is relevant to our mutual efforts to contain North Korea's development of nuclear weapons and the missile delivery systems that would carry such weapons. This is relevant to our ambitious goal of advancing international cooperation in curbing the damaging social and economic impact of rapid climate change in spite of today's announcement. But as long as people are anxious and fearful of their economic futures in a system they view as unequal, we will never achieve the political consensus required to secure a more stable and prosperous world for the 21st century. Global opportunities can indeed nurture local ambitions, and it is up to forward-looking leaders in both the United States and China, most importantly, all of you, the young leaders of your country, to explain and persuade people anywhere that their futures are tied to the well-being and fortunes of people everywhere. Thank you again. I am really appreciative to be here tonight. I look forward to hearing your thoughts and ideas during Q&A. I'm happy to talk about anything happening anywhere in the world, and certainly here in the United States. And I'd be very happy to discuss in greater detail various regional and international security and economic challenges that are of most interest to you. Thank you. You're not shy. <laughs> Wherever you want to go. Thank you. My name is Wu Shan uh, from Johns Hopkins Science, concentrating on Korea and China studies. Uh, thank you for your speech. Uh, that gave me a new uh, perspective to think about U.S.-China relations, which might have uh, a, a important implication, implications for global uh, governance. Um, uh, like my question is really about Korea. Um, uh, there are, as you know, like there are many uh, issues in the, the current U.S.-China relations, like the, uh, uh, for example, the North Korea issue and the South Chi China Sea issue. Um, how, uh, like, I just want to get your opinion about how uh, these two countries can uh, use their wisdom to uh, solve this, uh, like compared to global governance, th these issues can be a smaller, uh, frictions can be a smaller issue, but they, these days they tend to focus too much on those frictions. So like how can we really cooperate and uh, uh, solve these issues to achieve better cooperation? Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, it's very interesting. Uh, whenever there are economic meetings around the world, uh, and we'll certainly see this at the G20, People come uh, prepared to talk about the economic growth needs of the world and how to achieve them. But whatever crisis is the crisis of the day tends to overtake and overwhelm that meeting. And I spoke this evening about economics purposely because I think most people would expect I'll talk about national security and foreign policy goals, but the two are inextricably linked. They're, they're not separate. Just as domestic and international issues are not separate. They are completely linked. So too are national security issues, both in economic and physical and political security. Um, clearly, when our presidents met at Mar-a-Lago, they had a wide-ranging and productive conversation and agreed on uh, continuing a dialogue, a strategic dialogue, an economic dialogue, a people-to-people -people dialogue, and I think the fourth is cyber dialogue. This is excellent. This is very important. Uh, and then at the presidential level, those pieces really do come together. So where North Korea, South China Sea, all these figure, we saw President Trump, interestingly, uh, say, well, I'll be easier on trade with China 
uh, if uh, China cooperates more on North Korea. I'm not sure I would operate in that transactional manner. But nonetheless, I think what he was trying to say and to telegraph was the greatest security challenge facing us uh, certainly is terrorism around the world. In our view, would be, uh, from the United States' point of view, we have concerns about Russia, of course. You've probably heard about that from time to time while you've been here. Uh, but North Korea is a profound concern because they have nuclear weapons and they are rapidly trying to get an intercontinental ballistic missile that's capable of carrying a nuclear weapon. Uh, Ambassador Hills mentioned that I had negotiated with North Korea. What I was trying to negotiate at the end of the Clinton administration was to stop North Korea from testing missiles because if they couldn't test missiles, then they would never get a delivery vehicle for a nuclear weapon. And quite frankly, I'm concerned about China's security, Korea's security, Japan's security, uh, Europe's security, and our security uh, because North Korea is quickly capable of hitting all of us. And uh, North Korea's most recent nuclear test was very close to the Chinese border. And I think concerns were raised by Chinese citizens living in that part of China about whether, in fact, they were at risk because of this nuclear test. So I think it is a concern we all have. In the Iran negotiation, and I am very grateful for the strong partnership we had with China in that negotiation, it was really a superb example of countries who shared one clear, committed objective, that Iran not obtain a nuclear weapon. So even when we had differences, and we have plenty of differences, we all stayed focused. I'm, I'm digressing here for a moment, but I'll make a point. The Ukraine happened, Russia's invasion of Ukraine happened during the negotiations. In many circumstances, that would have blown up the entire negotiation. But the countries in the room were so committed to this, we kept our eyes on that objective. And we pushed everything else to other people to manage. So in the case of North Korea, uh, in the case of Iran, the United States had an enormous amount of leverage because of our secondary economic sanctions, which said to countries around the world, if you do business with Iran, you can't use US banks. You can't trade in dollars. You can't go through our banks. If you want a good relationship with US banks, you don't want to be doing this because you're not going to have a good relationship with US banks. It's the, very powerful to get Iran to the negotiating table, not to stop their programs. Sanctions don't stop programs. But they do sharpen the choice for, a, for coming to the negotiating table. In the case of North Korea, China has more leverage than anyone. China, I think, and that, uh, Minister Counselor, believes it does not have as much leverage as the rest of us believe you have. <laughs> but uh, China does have leverage. China has understandable concerns about using that leverage. China doesn't want to risk a war with millions of citizens coming over the borders, loose nuclear weapons, American troops on the peninsula, uh, reunified Korea, controlled by South Korea, with American troops and no buffer zone between China and the United States. All of these are real concerns. And when I was at uh, this last year at Harvard's Belfer Center, I worked with a group of graduate students. You can go on the website to say to them, here are China's concerns. What are the answers? And so they wrote a policy brief about what some of those answers might be. So go, go read it. So we want China to engage. That doesn't mean, and we are working hard to try to come up with a common plan, because this will not work unless we all work together. This will not work. In this, like Iran, unless countries come together with a single objective, it is impossible to succeed. South Korea has a new president. Uh, he's coming here in June. It will be very important to hear what President Moon Jae-in has to say. Uh, as you know, he is not happy with the THAAD. China is not happy with the THAAD, but it has been deployed. It is not targeted to China. I, I really say that with the deepest conviction in my heart. It is about North Korea. I certainly think if we could solve North Korea, 
a deal might get made to remove that missile defense capability, because it is about North Korea. Um, but we don't, all of the other issues we have are still there that we have to deal with. So you mentioned South China Sea. It is of tremendous concern. The United States has not ratified uh, the um, UNCLOS, the law of the sea. We should, but we haven't. We have a hard time ratifying anything through our Senate, as you all have seen. But we follow it. We act, at least in the Obama administration, we act as if it had been ratified. And we believe that any territorial disputes should be decided between the parties. And we do not think it is a good idea for any country to build up military bases on these rocks. Uh, and because we believe that freedom of navigation is critical. And although I appreciate China's belief in the 9.9 .9 line, it is not shared by the rest of the world. So uh, this is something we are going to have to work on, trying to find a way forward and a code of conduct that everyone can agree to. And ASEAN has tried to begin uh, that process. The United States does not have, as we say in English, a dog in this fight. We don't come down on one side or the other about who owns what. Uh, these things should be decided through law. Uh, the Hague, as you know, decided that the Philippines' claim was uh, correct. Uh, so we believe in, in law and the rule of law. Uh, so we will have to, we have a very complex relationship. But the other English saying uh, that you all probably are familiar with is, one has to learn how to walk and chew gum. We have to do many things all at the same time. And they don't all harmonize. They don't. But overall, we can get to win-win. In any given situation, we may get more advantage, you may get more advantage. But the question is, can we create a win-win so that both our countries rise? And as was pointed out, we don't have to sit easy trap we have peace. Long answer. Thank you. You don't have to apply, please. I'll applaud you. You applaud me. We're done. OK. Go ahead. You choose. I'm trying to fix Thank you very much, Mr. Irvin. Uh, my name is Kishin. Thank you very much for your talk, and, and I think it's very well delivered, and I believe very well received by the audience. So, uh, I, my name is Kishin Yao. I recently graduated from Georgetown University studying Asian politics. Are you going to run for office? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, so, but my question is about trade. Uh, I have once worked in a local campaign office in San Diego, California, and I heard people saying that China has been tricking the United States in bilateral trade, that China has somehow you know, benefited much more than certain segments of American society have. And do you believe that trade is a very serious concern in this relationship? And how do you see these two countries move forward, these two great economies move forward on the trade issue? Thank you very much. Yes. <laughs> uh, and it doesn't surprise me you worked in a political office. You, you have that, that sense about you. Um, Look, China is an enormous country. And your leaders have done an extraordinary job in reducing poverty in your country in an incredibly short period of time. It really is a historical anomaly, quite frankly, what has been accomplished. But part of the way it's been accomplished has been to be an export economy. And one of the things I think your leaders are trying to do is to shift the balance to more of a consumer-driven economy and internal markets and importing as well as exporting. As long as you are not imbalanced in that way, then it gives you some unfair trade advantages in the way that you proceed forward. There were also many years of concerns about currency manipulation, which you know, and valuation. I think, quite frankly, a lot of that has gone away. I really do. Um, so I think that uh, what we need to do is have honest conversation with each other. Your stage of development is different than ours. And you have so many more people than we do. 
I, I can't, it, it's hard for Americans to even imagine what it would be like to lead a country of a billion people. What are we, 350 some million? 364 million? So uh, I think Americans need to have an understanding of the task that Chinese leaders have. That said, we are a democracy. We believe strongly in the power of democracy. Uh, we believe in that governance reform over time will be very helpful to China, will lead to more of a consumer economy, will create a greater balance. China faces the potential for several bubbles, as we call them, real estate bubble being at probably at the top of the list. And these are never any good for a country. They weren't good for our country. Look what happened to us in 2008. And the last point I'll make is that what we learned most profoundly in 2008 is we are not decoupled from you and you are not decoupled from us. And no one in the world is decoupled from each other. How China goes, so goes the United States. How the United States goes, so goes China. If we do not work together on this issue of globalization, technology, the rules of the road, high standards for trade, we will both be in trouble. We will both be in trouble. Thank you. I should tell you that when I, this is really great, the first question was a woman. The, when I give speeches, usually the, in a mixed crowd, usually the first four questions are guys. <laughs> and at that point I say, okay, I know you women have something to say. I know you do, so. Thank you, it's my honor and privilege, thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Sherman. Uh, my name is Ye Shi, I'm uh, currently a law school candidate at Emory University School of Law. Uh, it's our great honor and pleasure to hear your keynote speech today. Um, I have a question which I'm not sure if it's appropriate or not. So if it's not, please forgive me. <laughs> In America, we often ask inappropriate things. <laughs> okay, so uh, the other day I saw a news about uh, President Donald Trump. He, uh, appointed, he had appointed a top China expert Peter Navarro, if I remember his name correctly. Uh, so I heard that he doesn't speak Chinese, and he's never been to China. Uh, so what do you think of that? And also, I'm curious about this position. So I wonder if it's a, a political appointee or a, a government contractor, and what are the main responsibilities and duties uh, does this position do? Thank so, you. Sure. Peter Navarro is in the White House. He is a political appointee. Uh, he is part of the trade and economic team for the president. But the president has many people who are part of any trade discussion. Obviously, the US trade representative, Mr. Lighthizer, who uh, has followed in Carla's footsteps, is very critical. The Commerce Department and Secretary Ross is very critical. Uh, the State Department, the economic division there is very critical. So there are many players in the US government. There is not. There's only one player who matters at the end of the day in the US government, the one who's been elected, the President of the United States. So even when you see an individual in our government that you may not agree with or you think is too harsh or too difficult, um, there is a large bureaucracy uh, who stays, who works for Democrats and Republicans and President Obama and President Trump uh, because more than anything, uh, most of us are patriots, and we believe in our country, and we will work to make our country successful, as you all do for China. So I would not worry about any one individual except the one who's been elected. <laughs> and he has lots of checks and balances on him. He doesn't, in our system, he doesn't rule supreme just like your president does not rule supreme. So there are, it's a different system, but it is a system. Uh, and it has something to say about where the country goes, and the same is true here in the United States. We have a system, and even an individual doesn't get to make all the decisions.
Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you so much for your uh, wonderful speech tonight. And I'm Hao Huang, uh, currently a doctor student in international business from Southern New Hampshire University. So um, in your uh, keynote speech tonight, you uh, illustrate so many important and serious topics. For example, you mentioned about the technology and innovation, and also you mentioned the globalization and identity. Sometimes it seems, you know, a little bit of conflict. So my question is, you know, very simple. I just noticed that tonight there are both, you know, young generation, I mean the Chinese students and also American, American students as well. So uh, from the aspect of a better and better uh, relationship between China and the United States, what will be your expectations and suggestions to our young generations to do to improve this relationship. Thank you so much. Thank you. We, we call that a softball question, and it's most appreciated. Uh, I think what you're doing is obviously critical. I think exchanges are the most powerful teacher in the world. Um, I am a strong believer that every university should insist that their undergraduates have an experience abroad. Uh, my own daughter, who's also a lawyer, uh, you know, spent a good deal of time in Central America, made her bilingual, made her understand what other people's lives are like. She's traveled now quite a, quite a bit. Not to China yet, we'll have to make that happen. Uh, but I do think that uh, it is important for all students to have an experience abroad, just to know that the world is larger than your own backyard. So I really congratulate you all and you know, salute all of you for having taken on this experience. And for the American students who are here, I hope you do likewise, whether it's China or somewhere else. So I think the exchanges, the trips abroad are critical. I also think that it is important to learn to be a critical thinker, uh, to uh, challenge, it, particularly at your age. Your age, you get a chance to challenge authority and to challenge ideas and to ask questions, whether inappropriate or appropriate, um, because it is the time that you should test things out uh, and see what you really believe. We all are raised by our parents with a certain set of beliefs, or by our churches or synagogues, for those of us who are religious, or by our communities, or by our party committees. But at your age, you should question everything so that you can decide who you are and what you want the future and the world to look like. Hi, my name is Yifan, Yifan Wang, and I study history in New York University. Uh, my question is Paris Agreement. Like, um, it's really sad news today to see Trump, uh, Mr. Trump, uh, <laughs> back out of this <laughs> agreement. Um, and I also see the headline of Chinese uh, newspaper saying that uh, President Xi uh, agreed, uh, confirmed that uh, China will be leading in this agreement. So my question would be, um, what do you think of this uh, agreement will play in the rebalancing of the US-China relation? And also, uh, as a human uh, being in the human community, uh, I want to, uh, I want to um, follow this question, like what do you think America will influence the environment, like future environment for uh, the, the Earth? Thank you. First, I share your disappointment. I'm actually relatively devastated uh, because I was part of an administration who worked so hard to get here. Uh, it was during President Obama's time that the agreement was made between our country and your country to set targets. That was a staggering breakthrough. It showed great courage on China's part, quite frankly, great courage and great leadership. Um, and the Paris Agreement, of course, was amazing. 
that 200 countries would come to such an agreement uh, was stunning and really heartening. I think it gave people a sense that difficult, difficult, difficult problems could be solved. A step could be taken forward. That's, that's really a precious thing. So yes, I am quite heartbroken today myself. But I am an optimist in life in general. And I believe that there is no turning back from the activism here in this country around the environment. So it may not happen at the federal level, and we may stop our funding of the Green Climate Fund, which is a tragedy. But our citizens at the local level, at the state level, are going to be all over this. Uh, because people want clean water, and they want clean air, and they see how many more kids are getting asthma, and they see the problems that are happening. And if you live on any of our beaches, you see the erosion. If you are living in New Orleans, you know the next hurricane can wipe you out. So uh, it will not stop. And the technological commitment will not stop because we have technological leaders in this country, like Elon Musk, who uh, is very upset about this himself today, who are going to keep trying to find breakthroughs so the technology can help us solve this problem. That said, you know, there is no question that countries who remain in will become leaders on these, this issue. And this is, from a United States competitive point of view, uh, part of my being so devastated by this, because uh, biofuels, solar, wind, and things we don't even know about. Things we don't even know about. I was in LA last week, and I went out to a meeting with Hyperloop One, uh, which is developing pods that through uh, electromagnetism and levitation will deliver people in cargo through a tunnel at 600 miles an hour. You won't even feel it. Incredibly uh, efficient in terms of energy. And really, you know, when I was skeptical of it at first, people reminded me people were equally skeptical of railroads and, and airplanes at one point in life. We, we can't imagine it, but they were, right? So there will continue to be breakthroughs here. Uh, but there is no question that China has a, an opening uh, because we are not in the agreement. Now, Germany, France, and Italy, if you haven't heard, have already announced this evening, even though President Trump said he was wanted to renegotiate and get a better deal, have said they will not renegotiate. Uh, so uh, we'll, we'll see where this all goes. Good question. Um, you know, I think we both have things we need to do domestically. As I said, here in this country, we need better retraining programs and lifelong learning for people. We need to think about our labor force of the future and do planning now because artificial intelligence is going to create a revolution that will be way more than even the Industrial Revolution was. And how we communicate today, how we live in life today will be exceedingly different when you're my age. I mean, in ways I can't even imagine sitting here. I can't even imagine. Much like people probably many years ago couldn't imagine that we are here today. I think when I left the State Department the first time at the end of the Clinton administration, 
Um, we had some cell phones that were this big. Uh, at the State Department, we didn't have the internet. We only had classified computers. So I went out into the normal world and found out a whole bunch of things that happened I knew nothing about. Uh, and it was, uh, you know, now, uh, you all, even more than the United States, your life operates on a cell phone. Everything operates on a cell phone. In the developing world, even more developing world than a lot of China, in Africa, everything happens on a cell phone. Banking, uh, agricultural data, everything. Health information. So um, I think we could work together to think about how we're going to get our workforces ready for this new world, to think ahead into the future. Obviously, we both have issues around urbanization and infrastructure. You all have built some phenomenal infrastructure, but you've had some challenges in the safety of some of that infrastructure. We have a lot of challenges around our infrastructure. We all have to imagine whether there are better engineering ways to do some of what we need to do. Um, because so many of the people in both our countries have moved to the urban centers, uh, people have talked about smart cities as a way to manage these dense populated areas so we can share some of our knowledge and information about smart cities. Uh, so I think there are a lot of things we can do together to imagine the futures, and I think it would be very exciting. It would actually be a great joint student project between American students and Chinese students to imagine the smart future together. We're running out of time, so I'm going to take one more, two more questions, one from a woman, one from a man. I'm going to stand up quickly if you can answer. Answer the both. Great. Yeah. So one here, and then the comments from over here. Okay. I'm so glad she has to call on you all, <laughs> not me. Go ahead. Thank you so much, Clay. Um, well, I'm, I'm a law school student from Emory University. Uh, I do have a question about the cybersecurity. Uh, uh, last year, China just passed a new cybersecurity law on uh, November, I think, and it comes into impact today, June 1st, 2017. And there are two parts of, that are quite controversial. First is that, um, let me think about it. <laughs> First, uh, uh, first, the law requires that foreign companies or foreign business need to uh, store the information on the service in China. Yeah. 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 And second, yeah. <laughs> and second, uh, China has the right to conduct kind of security review that uh, on any kind of products or service that will affect the Chinese national security. However, it uh, remains unclear that what is uh, what is like national security? So, do you think is this kind of threat to the cyber security between these two countries? And how do we all what we're gonna have in the future on the issues? Thank you. And then we'll do your question now. Thank you for your speech, Ambassador Sherman. My name is Han Shen Hall. I'm from the University of California, San Diego, as a master candidate of international. Politics, specializing in China and Latin America. So my question is specializing related in what? China and Latin America. And Latin so, America. So my question is related to China, Latin America, and the United States. So we both we know that um, ever since Mr. Trump's inauguration, his efforts of building a border wall, wall between the U.S. and Mexico has seriously undermined the U.S.-Mexico relations. But at the same time, China has been reaching out with Mexico. President Xi has been meeting with President um, Peña to discuss a series of economic cooperation and further co collaboration in terms of all aspects between the two countries. And the, at the same time, we, I noticed that the Trump administration has not been paying a lot of attention um, about its um, relations with the countries in the Western Hemisphere for uh, ever since its inauguration, and China has been constantly using this economic leverage to penetrate into this area, which triggered a lot of worries in the past, but not now, not seem to be the case now within the US government. So do you think that China's growing cooperation with the Latin America would trigger some alarm within the current US administration and make them to focus back on this issue? Thank you. Let me say 
say one thing that really relates to both questions. The U.S. does not fear the rise of China. A China that rises as long as we're all playing by fair rules and high norms is fine. A, a China that is strong and healthy and active in the world stage is good for the United States. It's good for our economy. It's good for our people. Competition's a good thing. It makes people do better. So they're, they're, whether it's cybersecurity or uh, economic development in other countries or economic relations with other countries, what matters is what are the rules of the game? Are people taking unfair advantage? Does one side play by one set of rules and the other side plays by another set of rules and so therefore it becomes an unfair issue? It is why having these dialogues that our presidents have agreed to are so important. On cybersecurity, uh, it was during the Obama administration that this dialogue got started. I'm very glad to see it continue. We need cyber norms throughout the world. China, for its own reasons, uh, limits what can be used in the cyber world. And yes, we are concerned about this law. What I think we need to do through this mechanism is to agree on a set of cyber norms that we can both agree to. There will be areas we will not agree, and we will have to try to work through them. But one of the most important things that we all can do in the world is to create a set of common cyber norms. Cybersecurity is a critical issue for every single one of us as an individual, every company, every organization, every even non-governmental organization, every school, and for every country. Serious issue, because even if it's not governments who are trying to spy on each other or hack into each other's computers, it is bad actors who are doing so. Uh, we have had a long concern, as you probably know, that, um, and I think China has really uh, stopped some of this, uh, stealing trade secrets uh, from our companies. Uh, and you have had concerns about what we have done in the cyber world. So I'm very glad that this cyber dialogue is happening because I think it's absolutely crucial. This is a huge area of concern for all of us. Every day I know someone is trying to hack my email. Every day. And no matter how many firewalls you put in, someone will figure out a way around them. So it's a huge issue for, for all of us and for the security of all of us. In terms of China's development, China has had a different model than the US about how we go into countries and provide economic assistance. But, and we think that there are some downsides to the way that China does it. And that it may be successful in the short run, but it has some issues over the longer run from our perspective. You probably have some similar views about the United States. I think it is perfectly fine for China to have a good relationship with Mexico, as long as the rules are fair and that we are all competing on a fair and open uh, playing field. I, as you've probably seen, President Trump has not gotten all the funding he wants for the wall. Uh, I think it'll be a long time before he does. Uh, uh, the administration ac has actually worked to try to uh, sort through the relationship with Mexico. Um, I think in the people uh, need to understand that in the uh, situation of the NAFTA renegotiation, the North American Free Trade Agreement, that was passed in 2011. There's a provision in that uh, agreement that says there can be a review in five years. So it's perfectly reasonable to have a review. Canada and Mexico have some problems with us, and we have some problems with them, if there is a way forward. But you will notice that the president did not decide to throw out NAFTA. And in part, he didn't throw out NAFTA, my understanding, because Secretary Ross of Commerce came to him with a map and showed him that the people who would be most disadvantaged by NAFTA going away were the people who had voted for President Trump. <laughs> <laughs>
So I think it will be a very reasonable and very productive conversation. I'm, I'm hopeful about where NAFTA will ultimately head. But of course Mexico uh, has a right to have a strong and good relationship with Mexico and China. Okay.